time before either of our times, in the time immediately following World War II in this country, Dwight D. Eisenhower was the President of the United States, and he started the Interstate Highway Program, okay? I-15, right here, I-80, I-70 to the south, that's all part of that program. And he did it for one reason, he needed to drive the economy, he was trying to make the economy stronger. And by driving trucking, you drove commerce, and by driving commerce, you drove the economy. Okay? But it had a couple of side effects that we didn't see coming. Uh, gas was cheap. The Middle East was incredibly stable. It was run by dictatorships, but it was incredibly stable, and gas was cheap as a result. Detroit was figuring out how to get the most horsepower out of every cubic inch of an engine. And this is where the American love affair with the automobile started. <coughs> Americans were going on vacation, they were going on the road like never before. Okay. And never in the history of humanity had human beings traveled at such a pace with such regularity. Right? They were routinely going 60, 80, 90 miles an hour. There were no speed limits on any of these interstate highways at the time. Okay. And uh, that was great. Everybody loved it. But there was one problem. They were also dying in unprecedented numbers, right? And then Lyndon Johnson, who is the subsequent president of the United States, and unfortunately is probably only going to be remembered for Vietnam, but he advanced social causes, he advanced civil rights, he advanced social welfare. He said, this is a problem for the government. This is a public health crisis, okay? Because by 1964, 47,000 Americans were dying every year in their cars. So that's if you packed rice cycles and then you took the entire faculty of the medical school on top, that many people were dying every year in their cars. And the population of the country was only 130 million. Now it's 330 million. And he said, this is a problem. We gotta fix it. And this is when NHTSA started. Uh, this is when seat belts had to go in cars. It was another 30 years before they became mandatory. But this is when auto safety started. Okay. Now the case I'd like to make about narcotics is it is a similar public health crisis. Okay. It shouldn't be very hard. So what I'd like to do for the next less than an hour is first build the case that we have a problem. Second, look at what are the contributing factors that make that problem. Third, what can we possibly do about it? So, building the case is not going to be all that difficult, okay? It's pretty straightforward. I'll show you numbers that sort of rival and it surpass, in some cases, motor vehicle deaths. Only these are, caused by, <clears throat> these are caused by medicines that are written by physicians. You know, this now, metaphor now has been beaten to death, the perfect storm, which is pretty amazing considering it came online less than 15 years ago. But it is a perfect storm. And I'm going to flog that for the rest, of the rest of the hour. But like any storm, and if you read that book, Perfect Storm, when a storm really gets rolling, a lot of things have to happen right or wrong, depending on your perspective, right? A lot of things had to happen right for Katrina to happen. And in order for you to be able to predict it or look at it, this can't be how you're predicting the weather, right? A radar dish on the top of Lincoln Continental, probably not going to get it done. But if you can be watching it from the polls and figure it out three days before it happens, then you can do something about it. Well, we have a similar crisis, and I want to show you how we're surveilling it and show you what we're going to do about it. I think it's simple enough now to make the case that we do have a crisis. Now answer a question for me, because I, I, I don't know the answer. 
Do you all take the Hippocratic Oath here? Because some med schools do and some don't. You all do, okay? So now, Hippocrates wrote it, if I understand that correctly. And uh, there's a number of translations from the Greek. But almost all the translations have some line that goes something like this. Right? I will not give a legal drug to anyone if I am asked, nor will I advise such a plan. And you know, hence the tremendous controversy around euthanasia. And none of you would intentionally give somebody a lethal drug. But the question is, are we unintentionally doing it? You can read the statistics here, right? And they're from a little over five years ago now. We use 99% of the hydrocodone on the planet. 80% of the prescription opiates. In case you're wondering about the denominator, we are approximately 10% of the Earth's population, maybe a little less. So we're taking more than our share. This is the prescription of opiates over the course of the last decade. And all the numbers, you'll see the back end on these numbers is 2012. All the numbers lag a little, right? Because the federal government has to collect these numbers. These are the prescriptions of the last decade. They have not quite doubled, but they're approaching it. The population has not nearly doubled during that time period, okay? I was taught when I was in medical school not terribly long ago that if you were writing for antidepressant medicine or high blood pressure medicine, then those were, the, the companies making those medicines were making the most money. But it turns out, in fact, the most popular script recently in the United States is hydrocodone with Tylenol in it. And it's not close. One of the next two medicines will lower your blood pressure, and one of them may or may not lower your cholesterol. Who is getting these prescriptions? And as I started to delve into this topic, I was pretty surprised, actually. I knew that opiate use nationwide was really rising, but I made certain assumptions as a trauma surgeon that it was going to be among a younger population. This is nationwide. This woman, Nina Volkow, she is an interesting woman. If you have the opportunity, she wrote this article in JAMA. She now runs um, uh, the uh, NIH section, which studies drug abuse. She is actually a psychiatrist by training. Her personal history is fascinating. Her story is fascinating. What she writes is fascinating. So if you have a chance to look into her, do. But she published this paper in JAMA about scripts written for one year. Of 202 million prescriptions for opioids, 85% of them were hydrocodone and oxycodone, but half of them went to patients between the ages of 40 and 60. That is not what I expected. I expected it to be either, either end of that, under 40, over 60. Not the case. And if you can see here, this is sort of who writes them. And this is how a guy like me gets involved in something like this. We, as orthopedic surgeons, are right in there with the internists and the GPs. Now, it's one problem if you write a lot of prescriptions, but this is the real problem, is that all these prescriptions are leading to a lot of death. And you can track pretty easily the change over time. So you look at the United States as a whole. I'm going to show you two maps of the United States, and the color coding is the same, okay? And the more orange it gets, essentially, the worse it is. But this is drug overdose mortality rates per 100,000 people, 1999. Right? So the Dakotas didn't have any data. And then as you get to here, the more orange it gets, the worse. Utah is right on the leaderboard. It's in the top five. And the company we're keeping is Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Maryland. And again, when I was training, drug overdose was something I associated with illegal drugs, right? street drugs. Flash forward 10 years. Same color scheme again, OK? The entire map has turned a heck of a lot more orange. Okay. Utah's no longer in the top five, but you know, we've been surpassed by Kentucky and West Virginia. <clears throat> so I don't know if that's worth bragging about. But in every state, with the exception of two, the numbers went up. The mortality rate went up. The side-by-side -side comparison is pretty stark, and that's just in the course of one decade. And it's not just death. Okay. Sorry, look at these numbers first. But this essentially, the, uh, the, this just shows our state. But essentially, they do this, they calculate this the same way they do motor vehicle deaths, but it's death per 100,000 population. 
from a motor vehicle standpoint, Utah is super safe. From a narcotic standpoint, absolutely not. And they ask, are you more likely to drag, die from a drug overdose or from a motor vehicle accident? And yes, you're more likely to die from a drug overdose in this state. Utah was the first state in which those numbers crossed, but in fact, it's true in the majority of states now. The cost goes beyond mortality. This is the medical cost here, right? The criminal justice system, but the cost to the economy dwarfs all of that. So, as I told you, if you look at the national map, the blue line here is motor vehicle deaths. And they're about flat, and they've been about flat for some time, maybe down a little. And you see opiate deaths rising. And this is nationwide. Nationwide, those streams crossed in 2007. Uh, we were sadly ahead of the curve. The curves crossed in Utah in 2001. Okay. We peaked in 2007. And then it started to decline for a couple of years. And our uh, people with Doppel, state authorities, really thought to themselves, well, we're making progress. We're on the mend. Well, the numbers are on the rise again. Okay? They st yes? Sorry. The Division of Pre Professional Licensing. If you end up with a license in this state, they're the people that give you your license. But it's not just doctors, uh, nurses, plumbers, any sort of professional but they are the person in charge of making sure that you stay up to date and that you are current. They're the person responsible for licensing you, right? So, so who's dying, okay? We know that the prescriptions are up. We know that the mortality is up. Who is it? This is from the VA system. In the VA system nationwide, in the, in the course of four years, 750 vets died that they know of from prescription opiate overdose. That's that they know of, 750 in four years, okay? They were overwhelmingly between the ages of 40 and 60, again, white and being treated for acute pain. The numbers in parentheses, in other words, the VA population is 50% between the ages of 40 and 60. The VA population is 70% white. But the people dying of the opiates are overrepresented. These, these, these groups are overrepresented. So how did I get involved in this? Well, uh, this is the first paper that really pointed out that orthopedics had anything to do with it. <clears throat> this is out of the Washington State Workers' Comp Database. If you had your lumbar spine fused for a worker comp related uh, injury in the state of Washington, they followed you out for the next 10 years. And from year three to year 10, the thing that you were most likely to perish from was actually the medicines we gave you. Okay. It was more likely to kill you than anything else. And workers' comp is generally, it's workers, right? It's younger people, by and large. So this was kind of startling. And then if you look at the age group where people are dying, it's, right, age greater than 40, according to that Valco paper, orthopedic surgeons are third. You say, well, third isn't bad. But there's so fewer of us than there are GPs and internal medicine doctors. So we are most certainly part of the problem. I polled my professional society to find out if anybody in there, I asked, we got 300 respondents out of 700 members. And I said, uh, to your knowledge, someone in your community has died of a prescription opioid overdose. And about half of them said yes. Statistically, it's probably close to 100%, right, in their community. And then has it happened with someone in your practice? And they said about, about 12% acknowledge that. And again, that's an awareness problem. Because statistically, it is extremely likely that someone in their practice has perished from a prescription opiate overdose. So that's the case. There's a problem. Agreed? I mean, you could disagree. It would make this more interesting. No? OK. All right. So that's the case. So then, we'll go back to the, the storm thing. What are, the, what are the contributing factors? What's causing all this, right? This can't be new. There's been opiates since there's been poppy, right? So this has been happening for a while, but why has this become a problem in the last 10 or 15 years? Why are people perishing from this now? Okay. So we're gonna look at four contributing factors, I believe. Who knows what the fifth vital sign is? 
Pain score, right? Okay, good. Do you know where it came from? I'm sorry. Uh, the fifth vital sign is the VAS score, the visual analog score for pain. You rate your pain uh, 1 to 10, or in some studies, 0 to 10. Uh, and uh, it is recorded now as the fifth vital sign. We'll talk a little bit about how it became the fifth vital sign. It started at the VA in the 1990s. And the VA was doing this, that you had to record, one, and two, act upon the pain score. And they found it to be very helpful, and they made it mandatory at the national, system, national level, the VA, in 1999. Now, there's, some, uh, there's something called the Joint, Joint Commission, uh, and they essentially are the ones that certify hospitals, not just VA hospitals, but they certify hospitals as okay practice, as meeting practice standard. And when the JCO comes to visit your hospital, all your ducks got to be in a row. And the JCO in 2001 said that all hospitals in the United States have to do this if they're going to maintain a license. You have to record the fifth vital sign and act upon it. Now what's interesting is, and two events being contemporaneous is not the same as causality, right? You all know that. You all have read a lot of papers. But this is when the fifth vital sign became mandatory. All the numbers in the background are, are graphs of poisoning deaths. Okay, contemporaneous, not a proof of causality. But let's look at the data that we're using. I'm going to show you two studies about the visual analog scale, the so-called fifth vital sign. It's pretty complicated stuff. Because if I asked you what is pain, and I asked you to define it in one sentence, you'd be pretty challenged. You'd be pretty challenged, right? What do we know about the other four vital signs? Well, we know what they are, right? Heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon, help me out. There we are, good. So those are objective. They are objective means somebody else measured them, right? And the absence of a blood pressure means you're dead, right? The absence of a heart rate means you're dead. They are vital signs. They are signs that you are vital, that you are alive, okay? The visual analog scale is not objective. It is from you, and it's hard to verify. And the presence or absence of it is not going to cause you to be dead. They took 400 cancer patients in this paper, and they used item response theory, which is how you all take tests now. After the first question, your, your response, if your response is right, you get a harder question. If your response is wrong, you get an easier question. Well, in medical research, in item response theory, when you ask one question, it determines what level your next question is going to be at. Not that there's a right or wrong, but it determines, it drives the next question. It's a much smarter way to get information. And so what they did was, they tried to really get at a true level of somatosensory pain, of bodily pain. And then they took those scores and they ran them up against the patient's VAS score. Now we treat the VAS like it is a linear scale, 1 to 10. This is where the responses actually land, okay? So in fact, a value of 2 is most close to 0, but a value of 6 is much more close to 8, right? It is not a linear scale. In other words, tachycardia, your heart rate is a linear scale. This is not a linear scale at all, but we treat it as such. Second study is more interesting, I think. Same thing. They used uh, an item response theory, but they, you know, that it, within emotional pain, essentially there are, there are, there are four or five areas. There's uh, depression, anxiety, fear, and anger. And they try to tease out those areas and somatosensory pain. And then they looked again at your visual analog scale, which your pain score, one to ten. Which one of these most predicted your visual analog pain score? It's not your somatosensory pain, it's your anxiety. People who are anxious, people who are anxious perceive pain in a very different way or at a very heightened level, okay? So here's the problem. <clears throat> if your blood pressure goes down, we give you volume to try to get your blood pressure back up, right? That is a dose response. If your VAS goes up, we give you opiates to try to get your VAS to go down. Okay? 
But the problem is, what if we're just treating anxiety? Opiates are not what you throw at anxiety. In fact, if you wanted to pick one medicine to throw at anxiety, uh, it's this one, okay? No, seriously, right? And I'm not here, I'm not here to shill for the marijuana industry, if there is a marijuana industry. Uh, but it is, we're using the wrong medicine if that's what we're treating, if we're really treating anxiety, okay? This is out of the trauma literature from the American College of Surgeons. They looked at whether or not the fifth vital sign, in fact, was protective of patients uh, on trauma services nationwide in two five-year samples before and after the fifth vital sign. You were twice as likely to perish from a narcotic overdose in the hospital, which is kind of difficult to do, after the institution of the fifth vital sign. And then the last study I'll quote on this is from the VA system itself out of LA. And they looked at, if you measure the fifth vital sign and are required to treat it, does the visual analog scale go down? Does their perceived pain reduce? In fact, it did not. So, there's very few things in medicine that we will continue to perpetuate in throwing a medicine at if the medicine wasn't doing anything, hopefully. All right, so I said there's four things going into this. The first is, uh, the fifth vital sign, potentially. The next may be the proliferation of pain specialists. This is a growing subspecialty, and in training I was told that you became a pain specialist by being an anesthesiologist. And it turns out that's not the case. <clears throat> it turns out that there's sort of an alphabet soup of agencies which will get you into what it has become a very, very crowded arena of pain management. There is absolutely a role for this. There are people that suffer, and there are people that need to be treated. But unfortunately, like anything else in medicine, when an arena becomes too crowded, the supply starts to drive the demand, okay? You guys may not have heard this expression before, but it's worth absorbing. There's nothing more dangerous than an idle surgeon. All right, and that means that a surgeon who doesn't have a full schedule is gonna figure out somebody to operate on. That's a problem, okay? Similarly, if you've got somebody who's out of work as a pain specialist, they're gonna figure out somebody to treat, right? So when people, you will hear people in the healthcare debate say, well, let's just treat it as a capital good. <clears throat> the capital good is bread, okay? When I'm hungry, I go to the baker and I buy bread. Let's say there were still bakers. I go to the baker and I buy bread. I drive the demand because I'm the one who's hungry. But in medicine, unfortunately, it's the surgeon who tells you if you need an operation. Right? The guy with the supply is driving the demand. So it's not a capital good. It doesn't work like that. It can't work like that. Sorry, that was editorial. You'll not be tested on that. Um, <clears throat> lastly, lots of pain specialists focus on blocks and different ways to get at pain problems. But in Europe, Netherlands in particular, where they've done a lot of work on this, it turns out that chronic use of opiates is not effective against chronic pain. It is not effective against chronic pain. So throwing more and more opiates at it does not, in fact, treat their pain. So we talked a little bit about the supply side. What about the demand side, right? Are people's perceptions of their pain changing? One thing you're gonna to learn to do as a physician is to set expectations. When your patient first presents to you with whatever the problem is, what they want to know almost more than anything else is what to expect next. These three words are something I used to use interchangeably, but it is important that we, like any other area of medicine, that we use language exactly. So abuse is the use of a medicine for other than its intended purpose. That's abuse. Dependence is when your body becomes physiologically dependent on that medicine. If by eight o'clock tomorrow morning, I don't have a cup of coffee, I get a headache. I am dependent upon methylxanthines, right? It's plain and simple. That's what dependence is. And then addiction is when that dependence alters your behavior. 
if you want to think about it in o totally oversimplified terms, when you start lying to get what it is you're dependent on, that is addiction. What is diversion? The DEA is the Drug Enforcement Agency that was founded in 1973 or 72, and they are the agency that essentially uh, monitor the use of both legal and illegal uh, drugs. And diversion for them is one person taking another person's medicine. Okay? And diversion is part of this problem. And there's also neurobiology, right? I have been skeptical, and many people have been skeptical in the past of the idea that, you know, uh, dependence is out of your hands. It is a genetic problem, but there's certainly plenty of data to suggest that this is part of the issue. There's two PhD scientists in the anesthesia department here that are doing some pretty fascinating work. They've figured out <coughs> that on nerve endings, there are all these receptors, and not receptors for the things that you would automatically think of, right? You would think that there are opiate receptors on nerve endings, right? But there are all these other things, immune, metabolic, adrenergic, things that you don't think of immediately. The other interesting thing they found is that this is not static. This changes all the time, the receptor profile, which is kind of crazy. It changes pretty constantly. That's a hard thing, though, to prove because it's on the nerve endings. And um, if you biopsy someone's nerve endings, you never get to speak to them again. They're going to be angry with you. Right? But what these Dr. and Dr. Light, Mr. and Mrs. Dr. Light, discovered is this the dynamic profile of these receptors is actually mirrored on, the, on your leukocytes. Leukocytes are easy to get, right, and, and much less painful. So they've studied a number of things, but it's, what they have found is this receptor profile certainly changes the way that you react to medicine, and some of these medicines change the receptor profile. So if, for instance, I give you a number of opiates at the time of your surgery for your cancer, what if that diminishes your ability to fight off the cancer? There's an entire world out here in this, in this arena that we're just beginning to hit the tip of the iceberg, if you will. We're just beginning to understand. All right, so there's the problem potentially with the fifth vital sign. There is the problem of patient demand and the expectation to potentially be pain-free. The third thing is for the physician herself or himself is that there is not an established standard of care. We don't know how many pills to give. We don't know how long to give them for. And there's sort of three, three pieces that go into this, right? We'll talk briefly about each of these. One is patient satisfaction. These are my Prescani scores. Do you guys know what Prescani is? Prescani is, it, it, if, I hope you've never been in the hospital as a patient, but if you were, you got uh, online a survey to do afterwards. Or if you go to the clinic, you will get online a survey afterwards. And it asks you about your satis satisfaction with various aspects of your experience, right? And uh, like anything else, we're expected to perform to certain levels. And these are, these are my scores. Red is bad, green is good. So I'm good in some arenas, I'm awful in some arenas. Uh, and it appears that between like October and November, I went from being the best doctor in the world to the worst doctor in the world. It's, uh, it's a little unpredictable sometimes. But I would submit to you that the problem is not that I have Prescani scores, but the problem is that I'm a little beholden to them, right? Our job at the end of the day is to protect the patient. One of the competing interests is that we have to satisfy what the patient thinks they need as well. The U has done an interesting uh, initiative on this front, and this is sort of, this is posted in every inpatient room. When you guys get on the wards, you will see these in every room. And I like the last point. We will make every effort to safely manage your pain. It acknowledges that while we are going to deal with your pain and try to give you adequate medication to deal with this, we have to do it in a safe manner. Second piece to this is the legal implications. Oxycontin is a narcotic which is slow released. Okay? It has been a target of much lay press discussion about abuse. Uh, 
And the government changed the labeling on this in 2007. And essentially, the labeling says that if you chew it up, it can kill you. Right? It's extended release. Like most extended release medicines, you're meant to swallow it whole, and the extended release op operates internally. If you chew it up, you kind of circumvent that. But these sorts of things are things that we are obliged as physicians, this information, every time you write a prescription for this, you're obliged to pass that on to your patient. And if you survey a room full of patient, uh, physicians, most of them wouldn't know that. I asked my professional society again, when do medical legal concerns come into play? And I was actually surprised at how infrequently they thought it was a problem. But there's quite a bit of legal history on this issue. There's a one-tenth of one percent chance that the DEA is going to look at your practice in any given year. Okay, that's pretty low, one-tenth of one percent. One in a thousand, I think. Yeah, the D is, is going to actually look at your prescribing practices. And then there's the aspect of the lawyers. I did not write this, I swear. William Shakespeare wrote this. <clears throat> it's from Henry IV, and uh, the two old fellows are fantasizing what would they do if they were king of England. And the one fellow says, the first thing we do is we kill all the lawyers. So the, the, lawyer, the legal aspect of this uh, is, is pretty interesting. This case is from Florida. There was a car wreck, and a uh, <clears throat> primary care physician was sued not by the person who was in the car wreck, but by the person who was struck by the motorist. And the primary care physician was sued for writing that person a prescription for opiates. Okay. And held liable. So, interestingly, there's only 18 states in the nation where it's illegal to drive on prescription opiates. Only 18 states. It's a little like THC. It's hard to actually test for acutely, right? THC is going to be in your system for a while, so it's hard to test acute opiate intoxication because the, the opiates can stay in your system for a while. Okay. Uh, this is actually a physician from this state, from up north, who's in federal prison now because the DEA came and looked at his practice, and after a pretty well-publicized trial two or three years ago, he has been sent away. What about, you all are about to enter residency training? Short period of time. Two years. Who's, uh, who's responsible if you, write, if you write somebody, right? Our residents write for opiates all the time. Well, what if somebody dies? What if the family brings suit? Who's responsible? Well, to date, I'm responsible, right? The, the attending, the faculty are responsible. The respondeat superior, it must be Latin, it says the master applies for the servant. So it is an interesting question, though, in training as these things go forward and protects you, but only protects you for the next three to five years, right? Um, I already talked about that some. I'll go over one more piece of case law, and then we'll move on. Uh, this is a case from the Cleveland Clinic young man came and saw a couple of surgeons about his knee and he said he had terrible knee pain and they did an arthroscopy on him couldn't find anything they, he did some rehab he had another arthroscopy they couldn't find anything and they said there's no objective findings to your knee we're not going to give you any medicine he unfortunately took his own life and the family sued and the courts found that the suicide, the, the failure of the orthopedic surgeon to give him medicine was not the proximate cause, the immediate cause of his suicide. But they did not rule out, they said, in future cases we do not rule out this as a potential uh, viable case. Lastly, this woman uh, wrote a very interesting piece in the Seton Hall Law Review and she said, the government has made it so easy for people to get opiate pain medicine now but the funding every year goes down for rehab. And so in fact, what they've set up is they permit the proliferation of opiates, but limited access to treatment, right? One out of 10 people who are reported to be addicted to opiates in the next year will be in some form of treatment. One out of 10. I gave you all that Kirby article. I don't know how many of you all read it. Many of you know who he is, Kirby? Right? He writes a column in the Trib, he has forever. His, his background's fascinating. He was a state trooper, a Utah state trooper. Right? He's a member in good standing of the Mormon church. He's an upstanding local citizen. And he was to give uh, a talk at a local charity. 
<coughs> that helped with, uh, among other things, addiction issues. And he said, I can't go there in good faith right now because I, for the last however many months, have been essentially shopping around for opiates. And he got involved in it the way a lot of people do. He had a shoulder problem. He went and saw a doctor in operation. He was given opiates. His body got dependent on them. And yeah, and then he was sneaking opiates for a long time. I find that helpful for people because people, again, have the discrimination. They have the, the feeling that, you know, that's a problem for other people. And people tell me in the clinic all the time, I'm not the addictive type. <laughs> We're all potentially the addictive type. Okay? So don't judge. Uh, and last thing is physician education requirements. And Dr. Powell was talking about this some. Now 38 out of 50 states require you to have some continuing medical education training in um, pain management. Okay? That is a radical change from 10 years ago when it was two. Uh, they generally feature these, some sort, uh, these sorts of videos which are, feature a lot of people of various genders and ethnicities that are generally better looking than any of the people I work with. But uh, you know the video. But here's what I would tell I, I, we got, a couple of us got to beta test the uh, Utah Doppel thing, and uh, four things to come away. It was, it was a three and a half hours of CME credit. It took about two and a half hours to do. And here's four things I came away with. It. Documentation is critical. We've entered the age squarely of electronic documentation where the note writes itself, and the note may say, I told the patient about the potential for abuse. I told the patient how long they'd be on narcotics, et cetera, et cetera. That's fine, and that's going to happen automatically. But you actually have to do it. Okay? And that's where the EMR gets in our way. It says that we did a lot of things potentially that we didn't. Okay? So we talk a lot about documentation. Talk about oxycodone. It is worth knowing that oxycodone is the single medicine most likely to kill a Utahn. That's one of the things they ask on their quiz, oxycodone. Uh, tramadol. You know what tramadol is? Tramadol exists in an interesting area between, uh, it works on the mu receptor if I'm not mistaken, but it is somewhere in a gray area between non-opiate and opiate medicine. It is a synthetic and um, many people use it as a substitute for opiates and they use it as a way to try to step people off of opiates. A uh, thing that you need to know about tramadol is there's a huge class of uh, medications it's not compatible with. You know what SSRIs are, right? It's selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, I believe. Antidepressants are not compatible with tramadol. And you need to know that if you're writing for it, okay? And lastly, methadone. Uh, if you get into doses above 100 milligrams, there's one serious cardiac side effect that you need to be aware of. Anybody know what that is? A prolonged QT which can be fatal if it gets prolonged enough, right? Okay. All right, those are things stack away, all right? They go through the signs of, uh, of drug-seeking behavior, uh, which I won't burden you with now. So those are, uh, p that's potentially the fourth area. But we went through it's what we think, or what I think, may be four of the areas that are contributing to why things have changed so radically in the ten last 10 to 15 years. You all need to know that 20 years ago, opiates were almost exclusively the domain of cancer patients. Treatment of pain at the terminus of life. Things have changed radically in the last 20 years, and some of it for the better, but some of it obviously has dangerous side effects. I'll spend the next seven minutes sort of wrapping up where to go from here, right? We've done a bunch of research on this, and I'm not going to burden you by chatting about my own research. I find it fascinating. I would be the only one in this room. Um, but we established what the baseline rate is. It's interesting, by the way, in one year, what percentage of Utahns do you think take a prescription narcotic? One year. 20%. 20%. In any three-month period, what percentage of Utahns take a prescription narcotic? 12%. Okay. So, and by the way, remember, uh, it's illegal to drive on it. Do you think 12% of the population is not driving? Okay, thanks. Um, 
We looked at different ways, different practice protocols. And by changing our practice protocol when we talked to patients about opiates up front, that meant the ones we spoke to about it, less of them were on opiates six weeks after their injury. Sadly, at 12 weeks after their injury, the two groups are exactly the same. One third of our patients went to someone else for a narcotic after their injury. One third. Okay. Uh, the risk factors for prolonged use are pretty much what you would expect. And then we took it to another step. We did a, a study in rats on bone healing. One thing you may or may not be aware of is a prolonged use of an opiate will give you hypogonadism. Okay. It will uh, suppress testosterone levels. So this is something that's been known to make bones not heal. So bringing it home to something I actually know something about. And uh, so we did a study in rats and we gave them opiates and sure enough, their bones did not heal as well. We gave them supplemental testosterone and it did not make up for it. Okay. Where are we gonna go in the future? There's a couple of different things. If we could identify the people who are at risk for the prolonged use of opiates, right? We could potentially save a number of lives. If you could figure out who they were up front, that'd be huge. So I'll talk about a couple, the neurobiology, right? If these neurotransmitters may predict your, your susceptibility to abuse, that would be great. So maybe a blood test. Um, we're gonna study something called attentional bias. Eric Garland's at the social work school and uh, he's doing work on attentional bias. Attentional bias is a little bit hard to explain, so I generally do this. All of you looked at something here. Everybody looked at something. Somebody looked at the pile of cash. Somebody looked at the man. Somebody looked at the woman. Somebody looked at the copy of Science Magazine. Um, I don't need to know who looked at Science Magazine. <laughs> uh, but that is your attentional bias. In some way, somewhere deep, deep, behind, deep behind the back of your brain, it's, that's how you're wired, right? Well, the same thing may be true for people with dependence, and Eric's done some work on this. If you saw them two pictures, like one very innocuous, a picture of a chair, and then a picture of a Budweiser, people who flunked out of AA, or uh, alcohol rehab, right, they are, it, um, it, sorry. It's a rookie move, I left my phone on, sorry. <laughs> this is super rude. I'm not answering it, I'm trying to make it stop. I swear. No, I, I on my first day with a cell phone. <laughs> I know I look old. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So you put up these two pictures, and then afterwards, for 0.2 seconds, you put up a dot. And then you ask them, where was the dot? The people who are going to flunk out alcohol rehab are going to say preferentially it was behind the beer, because that is their attentional bias. It works. So what we'd like to do now is going forward, Eric's done a, a bunch of interesting stuff on this. If we test people the day they come in the hospital, can we predict who's gonna be on opiates longer? More interestingly, after they've been on opiates for two weeks and they come back to the clinic, have some of them developed an attentional bias? So, it should be pretty interesting stuff, I think. Um, and then, uh, what about Prescani, these satisfaction scores? We're gonna uh, look at use of narcotics versus Prescani. So, I, actually, someone may have beaten us to this, yes. What is the safety score? So, like, I don't know, if you can come up with something like taking out the first day, that's what you can do. Oh, yes, are yeah, there, yeah. Are there correlations that? Is there? Um, you know, that's, that's such a hot button right now. Andy Tischer in our department is looking at that. Oh, 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 okay. Did he talk about it at all, or is he talking about hand stuff? Okay, all right. Yeah, but Andy's looking at that, and uh, I, don't, I don't know enough about it to tell you something intelligent. So, um, all right, so that's sort of where we're headed with our research. So what do you do with all this, right? These may be four, I'm gonna try to wrap it up uh, in uh, sort of what do you do about it going forth. Y'all are about to go out into the workforce. How do you make the, sort of get out of the storm and get a sort of safe harbor? I'm gonna keep flogging the storm metaphor. Uh, <clears throat> awareness is the first thing, right? You can't deny that you know now. And being aware of it, you, have, you simultaneously have to acknowledge that, like if any of y'all have had operations or been in an accident, it hurts, it's real. You got to treat that. 
can't just say, well, I'm done with narcotics. That's silly. With the fifth vital sign, I think we, hopefully we are moving towards a more rational use. Okay? Multimodal analgesia means there are different ways to make people comfortable. Right? There's a number of studies that demonstrate that ibuprofen may actually be more helpful for musculoskeletal pain than many of these narcotics. Multi, uh, we also use a lot of nerve blocks. We are, we are so lucky with our anesthesia department here that they are good at that. And then with this, uh, some of Eric's stuff is Moore's. Mindfulness-oriented rehabilitation enhancement. If you're aware that you have an attentional bias, you are far more likely to be able to defeat it. The problem with that is it's labor-intensive. Anything that involves talking for longer periods of time is labor intensive, right? And surgeons aren't good at it. Um, so if we could identify up front those who are at risk by history, by attentional bias, by biomarkers, that would be great. Part of your history now going forward should be asking people if they are taking prescription pain medicine, okay? Because I ask people, are you on any medicine? No. Do you take any prescription opiates? Well, yeah. That's medicine. But I. Watch, ask, try that, try that when you get on the wards. This is something else I've discussed with the patients up front and I documented in my operative reports how long we are, anticipate this person will be on, um, on opiate pain medicine. And at the end, it makes it easier when you say, listen, we discussed this at the beginning, we said at the end of six. The other thing is, as a physician, you need to, anytime you tell the patient what's gonna happen next, they appreciate it, okay? They all wanna know what's gonna happen next. So describe to them withdrawal. By the way, you only need to be on opiates less than two weeks to, to experience withdrawal. So describe to them withdrawal. And describe to them their family. And by the way, describe it to them looks like this. You get agitated, you get itchy, you will yawn a lot, and you're really a bear to deal with for about three days, and then you get through it. Okay? That's it, that's what opiate withdrawal looks like. Um, but if you predict that for them, they understand it's happening. Um, and then in our department, we have just tried to develop with some success, some, uh, some sort of more, more protocols and policies about uh, how, to, how to handle this. Remember, documentation is pretty key, but all of it entails talking to patients and you have to take the time to talk to them, okay? Uh, it is a real problem. I think we have established this, but hopefully you all as, uh, or won't be part of the problem now. You're the next generation of physicians. Oh, as long as you recognize it's a problem and you try to use a balanced approach, hopefully uh, it brings us to a better place. Questions? Yes, Amy. Uh, what is the status I thought it was supposed to go online in 15. So, and the requirement is four hours every three years. And so this online module is three and a half hours. Uh, and, I mean, y'all aren't beholden to CMEs now, your CME is what you do every day. But um, uh, lectures like this, we have gotten in our department to count towards that. And is that in addition to the 50 every two years? I think those four would be part of the 50. So you need to be talking about state license, you have to have 50 hours of continuing medical education every two years, which if you go to the I don't, I don't know either. Any questions? So if someone say is already tolerating opioids, you know, this is probably, um, these two, um, I don't know, these are higher than these. Um, what would you do for those people that do know? That's a real uh, challenge, is people with a history of abuse that don't want to be on it. Uh, we try to use very short doses. We try to use things like nerve blocks, and we try to lean more heavily on things like acetaminophen and ibuprofen, which actually do work. People don't take them seriously because they're over the counter. They actually work, which is weird. And then, yeah, it entails a lot of talking. All right, guys, thanks.